So we're on the last of these cafe talks, which I think have gone really well. Um, I'm glad that we've done so many because the discussions have been very different each time. Um, but let's talk a little bit about, you know, the foundation of cover crops is really picking your goal and understanding what you want to do with that cover crop. And so um, in a lot of cases, I think, you know, our cover crop goals will be managing water this year. We want to get some of that subsoil moisture out of the profile so that we can allow the whatever snowpack we get to refill it um, and hopefully take care of some of the excess moisture. But I think Reducing erosion is another major goal. And I just saw some pictures, um, I think Naeem might have seen them too, I can't remember, but they were from um, just north of us and there was, there was soil in the ditch. I mean, just dunes of soil blown into the ditch from, um, from all this wind and uncovered fields. So I think getting fields covered is gonna be a major, a major goal for a lot of people. Uh, weed management, breaking compaction, improving the seed bed, um, creating a living soil, all those things are important because we're not gonna have a cash crop on it this year. So we need to replace that cash crop with something like a cover crop. Um, to pick your mix, I, I usually pick by the roots on the plants because that's where I'm most interested. But I think above ground biomass is also an important consideration. Um, I do like some of these things like dwarf Essex rapeseed. I like radish, I like flax. There's a lot of favorites that I have, um, but I want people to be aware, and this is something we've talked about on these calls that if you have canola in rotation, uh, you should not be using brassicas like rapeseed, turnip, or radish because of the club root concerns. So if you have canola, just don't use those other brassicas because uh, they can be hosts. And it's the same with things, they're hosts for soybean cyst nematode as well. So if you have severe pressures in soybean cyst nematode, you need to stay away from several uh, different cover crops like um, I think it was turnips and hairy vetch, um, which we want you to stay away from hairy vetch anyways. Um, so there are other, we have lists of those and maybe I'll talk about them here in a couple slides. Um, if the, this was PP from last year that was going to be grazed after September 1st, when they push that deadline up, we don't anticipate that deadline moving from November 1st. So Kevin Sedovic and Miranda Meehan have actually just put out a nice article on cover crop mixes that could be grazed after November 1st and some ideas there. Um, I retweeted it yesterday, but I can also find find the link to it and post it on the NDSU Soil Health webpage where we have a prevented plant tab or button you can push to get all this information. So I'll link that on there as well. Um, if you are gonna go to corn in 2021, uh, just make sure you don't use only radish and turnip in your mix. Um, it may seem easy because you could broadcast it and use some kind of vertical tillage to get some soil over it, but um, you need something mycorrhizal in there, which could be a legume. Um, but it could also, it just throwing in oats or barley or something uh, simple can really help keep that mycorrhiza going to avoid issues with phosphorus uptake in your corn. You need to kind of prime the soil with the, with the mycorrhiza and keep them going and living so that when you plant corn next year, you don't have issues. Here's another example of a mix. This was not prevented plant, but it was, um, it was a field that they were going to graze and they did graze. Uh, this is, so I wanted to show this because it has sorghum in it, which is a really, is a great warm season option for drying out wet soils. Um, so as we're getting later in the planting season for cover crops on PP, we really need to consider that warm season grass component for effective competition with weeds and growth as well. So um, Marisol has done a, quite a bit of work in this area and, you know, two pounds an acre is usually enough. So um, especially is enough when to put in a mix. So um, so keep that in mind as an option. It does put on a lot of biomass. So if you feel like, like this level of biomass is gonna make you uncomfortable, then you need to pick maybe a millet or something different as a warm season grass in the mix. Uh, here's a, a figure from some work we had done at the end of a, a field. Um, we had these small plots out there where we seeded different cover crop mixes and then we put in some individual species just so we could learn and see what those cover crops do and how they look. Um, and so, and we also had some bare plots in that, in that trial. And so this is all replicated. Um, but here, this light blue line is the bare soil. And that's where we just kept it, kept it bare all year. And then we measured moisture content at the end of the, end of the season. And so the one thing that stands out to me, um, and actually, and so sorry, all these other ones are cover crop mixes where we planted some kind of cover crop. What stands out to me is this moisture bulge right below the surface where, where we're not, 
we're not evaporating that water and it's not draining into the soil. And so we're left with this kind of pudding type soil consistency right below the surface. And I think that's what's, what's hurt us this year also is that having that layer there uh, that's retaining moisture where it's not evaporating because it's too too deep in the profile, but it's also not draining because maybe the infiltration or or something is not allowing that water to move. Um, but when we use a cover crop and we introduce roots and plants to the system, we can transpire that water and start moving that bulge away and getting the soil profile dried evenly. Um, and so this green line here is, a, is our most diverse mix where we had cereal rye, dwarf mystics, rapeseed, sugar beet, sunflowers, peas, flax. Um, so you can see probably all those different rooting depths and types of roots and water use requirements for those plants are helping dry that profile out. So if you can use a diverse mix, um, if, if there are some other con, uh, constraints that don't allow you to use a diverse mix, we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, of course, for, for nitrate capture, you can see how on the bare soil, this light blue line again, um, we have excess nitrogen in the system, but here with the cover crops, we've, we've captured that nitrate in and it's held within the biomass. Now we don't know when that's released and probably not for the next year's crop, but we do know that it is held within the system and, and not in excess. And then when you go to plant into it, this is from you know December 31st of 2014, must have been when we had these plots. Uh, this is how the, the cover crop residue looks. And to me, that's not, not very scary because you compare it to what the barley residue is over here. And to me, it looks pretty similar. So. Um, so if people are concerned about residue, these, these cover crops decompose best when left in the soil. Um, and, and you can see that it has excellent ground coverage to reduce erosion over the winter as well. One of the worst things I think you can do is work up a full season cover crop. And so this is an example where that cover crop, I think they ran some kind of chisel plow through it. And you can see the radish and turnips are just laying on the surface. And uh, they're not gonna decompose as well on the surface as they would in the soil. So the best thing is just to leave it intact, don't chunk it up or, or bring it up to the surface and, and plant right into it the next year. Um, so the idea of, of whether you use a mix or a monoculture, I think um, it, it really depends on your goals for the field and some of the existing like weed pressures that you have or conditions that you have that you, that you think you get a better stand with a monoculture or maybe you're, you're able to use a mix. Um, so I, I think the first tip is really to start with a weed-free field. Um, so repair any ruts, do any ditching, get the field conditioned so that it's ready to go for next year before you plant a cover crop. And here this farmer didn't have really intense weed pressure, so he planted a diverse mix of radish, turnips, sunflower, oats, and peas. Um, he got great coverage, 28 pounds per acre, 20 bucks an acre. Um, I think you can play with your mixes and adjust them to get them to the price that you want uh, for those mixes but always start with a clean field. And then here's that same farmer had another field where he had some pretty intense weed pressure. So he just seeded cereal rye, which you could use winter wheat. You could use another, you know, just, you could use oats. You could use oats plus millet, um, something that's just a, a grass in there. And then, you know, consider using a mixes and then you still have a herbicide option uh, to spray that field mid season. So this was 10 bucks an acre, what he did. Um, it worked really well. He was happy to see it, it did survive the winter and it looked pretty good the next, the next spring um, and continued to use moisture. If you're gonna seed a cover crop that, that has a potential to put a head on it, uh, you, may wanna, you may wanna spray it out before that happens. Um, number one, that keeps the, the material maybe easier to plant into. Um, if we're starting to get dry, you may wanna spray it out. Um, it also will keep the it, it from producing seed, so that may be an option. So just keep that in your in your mind as something you may want to do. And then something from Andrew Friskoff that we actually just put on the um, the Soil Sense Field Check podcast, where Andrew Friskoff answered a question about using something like barley or oats or what should be used as a cover crop on PP this year if going to wheat or barley next year. And you know oats. Are, are more favorable for him in that because they can get scab, but they're not a great host. Um, some root rots are possible, but it's a pretty low risk um, when using oats prior to wheat or barley. Uh, but he did say, don't limit yourself on what you're gonna plant this year based on what you wanna do next year, because if, if you have salts in the field and you need to put barley out there, the best thing you can do is manage those salts with that barley and then, and then figure out how you're gonna manage the potential diseases next year in your crop. Um, so that's what I have for um, for some background info and just to get us thinking. And I see we've had a few more people join the call, which is great. Um, 
we've got a question already, which is good from, from Reed. And has anyone planted or tried guar as a cover crop this far north? I know it won't produce seed as it originates farther south, but it acts like a cowpea or buckwheat, uh, looking for more diversity in sandy drought-like soils. I've heard a little bit about it. Um, I don't know, Marisol, do you have any experience with that or? Um, yeah, uh, Burton Johnson has grown it several times in uh, our stations, but mainly trying to see if we can get seed with some of the early varieties, but we haven't grown as a cover crop. But like you said, this is, um, it's just like a cowpea. It's gonna behave very similarly to cowpea. So some years we were able to produce seed of war in our region, but most years, like you said, it won't. But, um, you know, it's a legume and everything else is a warm season. It's just like you have a soybean or, uh, I mean, a cowpea or, or a forest soybean or something like that. But uh, never as a cover crop, but no, I haven't tried or haven't tried on Mexico either. I'm guessing with that, we need a specific inoculum also, um, like sun hemp wood or any other, other legume we need to. Probably. Yeah, I'm not sure which is the specific one. Because it's a different, uh, it's in a different genus, but the plant looks a lot like a cowpea. Mm -hmm. I think that it would be a good option because if the objective is not to get the seed um, and it's a warm season plant, uh, it's a legume, it would add diversity depending upon the price though. If it is super expensive, you know, obviously then, then we have other choices. Mm -hmm. But I personally think, but I would plant it as soon as possible because it's a bit susceptible to frost. Yes. So There's that, a... yeah. So if you want to get good vegetative growth out of it, plant it as soon as you can. I wonder if I just saw on Twitter somebody in South Dakota had planted it, maybe in their 60-inch corn row spacing or... Um... I think that somebody down there is playing with it. Maybe Brian Jorgensen or somebody like that is is put that in a mix. Reed, do you know if uh, cover crop companies are already selling wire for seed for cover crop? Are they offering it as a cover crop? I, I don't know that. That's why I'm asking. I don't know. Chris, do you know? <clears throat> Chris may be on the road again. Can't unmute. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know that, but maybe somebody knows if it's being offered as a cover crop. Well, and somebody had asked me at one point if it's maybe a little bit more salt tolerant, um, which I, I, in general, legumes are not really salt tolerant. Naeem, have you heard anything on that? I, I've read it that it's a little bit salt tolerant, but again, it would be like, uh, for example, you know, regular alfalfa versus salt tolerant alfalfa, you know, not too much of a difference. But I agree, generally, legumes are not that salt tolerant, but maybe it's a little bit more salt tolerant. So then, Reed, what are you, um, what do you already have in that mix that you want to add diversity to for those sandy drought like soils? Maybe we can come up with some other options. Yeah, okay, so Chris says he's on the road and yes, guar is, is available. <laughs> and Chris is with Agassi seed. Okay. Um. Yeah, no, I, I was just looking at uh, just different diversity. Um, not really specific on um, like absolutely wanting to put it in the mix, um, but just looking at other options as I know farther west you go, um, out of New England, Dickinson area, um, you get limited to drought-like soils and sandy soils and such. So um, I was originally thinking barley and a few other things um, with the legumes, but um, just 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 thinking of more more diversity. So Reed, uh, Gore does like a little bit of moisture. So I don't know how much rain you get there. And if you have, it, it does like good drain soils, but if, if you're dry there and if you have sandy soils, um, and again, but every year is different. I would, I would say that if the seed is not ex that expensive, you should try it. It seems like a good option, but just keep that in mind that, um, you know, you guys are a bit drier there. 
and you have sandy soils and it does require some water, you know, especially in the early stages. I actually grew up eating guar, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> looking from a different perspective. Is it tasty, Naeem? It is, you have to develop a taste because it, it is slightly gummy. Uh, my dad loved different stuff and he would ask my mom to cook it, cook that, all different vegetables and everything. And some of them I hated as a child, but then you have, you know, I developed my taste too, I guess. Depends who is cooking too, so. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of curious as to if you, well, so if it's if it's susceptible to frost, it would not be a good one if you're going to graze it. And I, I would just be curious if cows like that or if they prefer a, a cow pee, I guess. But. Uh, yeah, I will know about that. Uh, but we can find information if you're interested, Reed. But uh, like I said, we haven't really tried it. But uh, my guess uh, for what I've seen when it grew, we grew it and prosper is it's just like an, a copy. I don't know if it has any other benefits. Different. It, ha it has actually uh, the, the, because of the gelling effects, they are saying now that it could be used for the fracturing process for the oil. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard that some people are using it in making ice cream actually. Yeah, but that's the seed. So you have to produce yeah, the seed. seed. Yeah, seed. Yeah. You have to produce the seed. The seed has like a mucilage, you know, like a viscous sun sun substance when you put it on water. And so that's what they're talking about using it in fracking and they're using it on, it's using foods, like you said, it's, it's edible. And um, a lot of the food industry uses water. If you look at uh, the label of a lot of products that you eat, uh, I would say half of them you eat, if you look, it's gonna say war gum in it. Mm. So it's a very common industrial food product they use to thicken uh, sauces and all kinds of products in the food industry. So they use in high demand, and I think the U.S. produces some in the South, but mostly of water that's used in the U.S. is imported from India and uh, some some Asian countries. But I know, and they do produce some in Texas. Uh, they do; they're producing some some water there, but I don't know the the acreage or the amount. So I'm thinking about cover crops maybe I've seen on sandy soils. If anybody else on this call has sandy soils, um, you know, typically what I've seen on sandy soils would be things like peas, um, flax. Radish is a pretty high water user, right, Marisol? So that one, if, if it's drought-like, yeah. you probably don't want radish. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, radish likes water. Hmm. So, um, yeah, I think in a sandy soil, you probably don't you want to stay maybe with the grasses uh, in some like shallow rooted uh, broad leaves. So I think the, the grasses will build the most structure in that soil. I mean, with the, the way the roots wrap around the soil particles and the fungal hyphae and all that, mm -hmm. um, and increase organic matter, I think, more efficiently than um, for, for water holding capacity. Uh, I've seen some pretty amazing things on sandy soils just by reducing tillage and having something like oats out there, some kind of grass. Um, but maybe being this late, you'd want also, you know, a millet or something in that mix to get some growth. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, warm season grasses use a little bit more of water, uh, but I don't know. I think if you have oats, it's, it's good and and maybe, you know, peas, peas will don't use much water. It's something that might work too. Um, I, I like the idea of mixing a legume, uh, a, you know, no, which would not require a lot of water because then it will help break down the biomass quicker. Because the, the sandy soils, you know, we, we could in, increase the water holding capacity um, like in two, three years if we tried different things with cover crop mixes. The key is what are we planting and how, how fast that residue can break down to help with that water holding capacity. And then, then after a couple of years, you know, probably we could get away with planting something different. Certainly, Naeem, I think I asked you last week, so up in that Northeast corner, I mean, you're at a fine line where you need 
residue cover to reduce erosion, um, but you also don't want too much residue because you need to have the soils warm up and get, get them planted. Um, so what would your ideal mix look? Say you've got a, a the field was harvested, the crop is off of it, obviously, um, and that happened maybe earlier, so it's had a little time to dry out. Um, obviously couldn't be planted to the cash crop they wanted. Um, what would be your kind of ideal mix that you would go for? What would be the questions you ask for that field before you pick a mix? So number one question I would ask, like does, does these areas have any salt issues? You know, a little bit of salt would be okay because barley and oats, I, I like them and, and they are quite salt tolerant. But like I said, like the biggest concern of the producers here is would this residue break down? Would I be having any issues in, in Nexus, during next spring? Um, so I would, I would go with barley and oats and then I would have forage peas as a legume to bring the CN ratio to a level where uh, most of the residue is broken down. And we don't have a lot of livestock here. So, you know, people may want to chop the residue, um, you know, so that it has more contact with the soil. And uh, yesterday I was discussing this with another producer. So if th that's a PP field, then I suggested actually a um, couple pounds of sorghum Sudan grass and uh, Marisol answered my question even when she was on vacation. Um, I asked her, would uh, that residue be a problem um, for the farmer come 2021? And she said, as long as you use two pounds per acre, it shouldn't be a problem. So, uh, depends how, how much money we want to spend, but barley and oats, you could either pick one of them or you could just have both, just reduce the seed rate. Um, so roughly it should cost you roughly the same amount of money. Field peas and two pounds of sorghum sudan grass. If the spots are high for salt, then I would like to go with wheats too. And again, we discussed that. I think Marisol, you said that as long as... Uh, what was uh, two pounds, I yeah. think, you, two, two pounds, mm -hmm. then the beets should melt. And no, it's, it's not going to be a problem. You know, the problem with residue from like sorghum or sorghum to the end happens if you have like a full stand, then, then it's when it freezes and, you know, dries, it's, it's kind of like corn store, you know, it's a hard material. Hard. But if you have two pounds, you're not going to have uh, a lot of that stover and it's going to get mixed and it's not going to be a problem. I really don't think it's going to be a problem. At least our plots where we have the two pounds next year, you, you don't see an excess residue on them. So even though like barley and oats and sugar beets would work on salty areas, but I think even on good areas, they're good crops. They're good crops. So with beets you have, you People can plant radishes too. And around here we have more, more water, but then we have club root issue. So if you have canola in rotation, you want to avoid all brassicas. Um, so that would be the ideal mix, Abby. Yeah. And I actually suggested that to a producer yesterday or day before yesterday, we discussed that barley and oats both, uh, two pounds of sorghum Sudan grass, field peas and beets at most one and a half to two pounds per acre. I think that's a good mix. I've, I've heard um, there was a farmer last year that had a, had a predominantly barley mix, but he had some radish in there, but he got, and he had some areas where he had peas that got established nicely with it and somewhere he didn't get them planted deep enough. And he said the areas that he was planting into the spring where he had the peas, the residue was much more mellow and easier to plant into. So I think, I think that, like you're saying, that legume component can be really, really important uh, for the residue breakdown. Um, the legumes are probably gonna be one of the most expensive seeds in the mix. Um, so if, if, you know, gosh, if you need to reduce costs, I don't know if you just reduce the rate of the legume versus totally cutting it out because maybe some is better than none. Um, if we have say beets in, in that mix, you know, the beets tops are also very green. So we could probably cut down on the uh, legume seeding rate. Um, but if we do not include beets, then um, it's, a, 
it's basically providing a balanced diet to the microbes to you know break down that residue because for some producer they want to plant cover crops but they are now worried about the growth and they are saying oh you know i may be late uh, planting my crop next year so that's a big concern um, for people some people so i think i think that's a good point because i i'm sure there's there's quite a few people that are concerned about you know last year they had crop residue in the field and then they had to plant into that this spring and maybe it didn't go as well as people had hoped i mean i think there's a lot of stuff that was mudded in that probably whether you had residue or not probably wasn't gonna gonna turn out very well but but i think that cover crop residue because of the diversity in some of those mixes i think you that residue is much different to plant into i think than than like corn residue or something um, from the prior year. Corn or even sometimes wheat. Um, so uh, yeah, I think um, this is an important point to, you know, separate that if you just have um, residue, which is very high for carbon, but very low nitrogen, it's going to take a long time for it to break down and that may cause you some problems during the planting time. Yeah, so if, if anyone's concerned about what it was like planting into a crop residue versus what it might be like planting into a cover crop residue, I think it will be a very different experience for you. <laughs> and I see Joe, Joe Eichley's on now. He must be done spraying his plots. Are you still in the field, Joe? <laughs> No, we got things started, but it's going to be a long day, so I just had to break off. Uh, well, we haven't had any weed questions yet, which is which is good. Does anybody have any weed questions for Joe? All right. <laughs> I'll go back to mute. <laughs> uh, I did. So, okay. So Joe, I drove, I had to drive a, a kid home yesterday that was over playing with my son. And I drove by a ton of fields that have very large weeds in them. Um, mainly fields that were, that were corn that just got harvested about a week or two ago. And the weeds were, were huge. Um, so what are you thinking on those fields? Because obviously somebody's gonna plant a cover crop on them, but we need to get those weeds under control first. Yeah, at, at this point, and I mean, especially with being in Cass County, um, I'm guessing they're going to be conventional tillage and tillage would really be the best option at this point with how large some of the weeds are and and also a bunch of them are starting to flower and herbicides won't be as effective on, on flowering weeds whereas tillage will still be very effective so you know for those fields it, it's really to the point of, of tillage being the best option that we have with those really large weeds. And some of them I noticed were actually horseweed or mare's tail, which is typically more problematic in no-till, but I've seen a lot of these um, standing corn fields, that being in there, and I automatically assume glyphosate resistance with horseweed. And then that leaves us with not any good options on 12 inch or taller horseweed, except for tillage being the best one. Your favorite word. <laughs> well, like you said, though, if, if the system is already full tillage, um, then yeah, don't don't be trying to go no till on a field with a bunch of weeds and, and residue that's not managed. I mean, that would not be the the success rate, I think, would be very low. So unless people are looking for a reason to say no till doesn't work, the, I mean, that would be the ideal situation to go into and try to no till um, to make it not work. So, so yeah, take care of the field first and get it get the weeds under control. I would also do a good job preparing the seedbed for a cover crop if they chose to go that route. What I'm hoping is not to see fields. There's a bunch of fields I saw last year that weren't touched for another month yet. We weren't touched until the end of July. And then the seed production, weed seed production in those fields was 
quite high before they got worked the first time. But last year was a bit – well, we were just entering the wet spell at this point last year, but I know that had a lot to do with it, all the rain in late June and July that we had. So are you seeing a lot of those problems carrying over into this year as far as weed pressures where they still can't get them under control? or uh, Somewhat in, in PP fields and also in other fields that just had a lot of water hemp last year, the, the water hemp pressure this year is just – outrageous and it was very wet summer is good for water hemp so it just was a problem last year and then the seed production is showing this year on that one in particular okay so people that may you know even on non-pp fields are going to be dealing with water hemp pressure and and what are you what have you been recommending for for that just because i'm curious it depends on the crop and we still have you know plenty of options especially if you're in one of the newer traded soybeans um it, it's really kind of crop dependent and it it's it's really we've got some overall recommendations for extend soybean or enlist soybean or corn or even uh wheat we typically don't think of it as a problem in wheat or small grains but by the time we got planting the small grains in uh the areas of the state that also have water hemp, water hemp was already up. So, you know, we have a couple options there as well. Um, but it's you know, just aggressive this year. So it seems like it's taken two passes in each field to actually get water hemp fully under control to this point. Yeah, somewhat of a quiet group today. So I just want to quickly um, add a point that, uh, you know, the importance of planting cover crops on PP acres. I remember last year, the way weather was here around Langdon. We were very dry until July 29th and from July 30th or 31st, we started getting rain. And the reason we are having these PP acres, uh, a lot of PP acres in Cavalier County too, because of the wet fall. So if we have a cover crop growing, and if we again have the same kind of a weather, uh, that that cover growing cover crop can use up that moisture. Because weather can change very quickly. Yeah, I know Franzen always talks about how a you know a PP field, if it doesn't get something on it this year, could be a PP field, or the chances highly like it will be PP again next year. So, I know it may not feel like it sometimes because the soil, the surface is so dry right now. So I, I'm kind of wondering too, you know, if, if we see these cover crops on a field, we know that seeding is actually using a drill is going to be the best way to establish them. Um, you know, if, if the surface is so dry and then the, the soil underneath is still pretty wet, um, you know, how long will it take for that cover crop to establish? And sh is it worth it planting it a little bit deeper? I mean, some of the, like radish, you wouldn't want to plant radish deeper, I don't think, um, in these situations, but. So I have a different question. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, so I'm in uh, Yakima, Washington, and um, there are hops and hops that are hop yards that are using cover crops. And I was talking to a farmer yesterday and trying to understand a little bit more of their system. So in this system, we have sandy soils, clays are pretty much gone, blown out, because we have tons of wind. And um, then you have the other thing of irrigation here that just kind of, the water just moves the soil a lot. Um, so in his mix, he has some uh, different, two different types of oats, I can't remember, wheat. 
so with his goal, he was trying to also peas and buckwheat. Try to build more of the carbon to then hold, um, you know, that organic matter to then be able to get more out of the soil. So is there other mixes that you guys would have any ideas on? And it kind of goes back to that sandy question soil earlier. But this is just me and observations of a Midwesterner out in the middle of a desert and trying to learn more about their system. <laughs> and it's really cool to see cover crops there because or else they just freaking fill the crap out of the middle or in between the rows and hops and it's really puffy or else it just gets really compacted. And either of those options make it really hard to continuously walk in a hop yard, just for other fun knowledge there. So this this isn't for hops, but um, what I saw last year was some uh, hemp that was being grown and they put tep grass between the rows. And I don't know, Marisol, does tep do okay on sandy soils or is it um, does it like a little more moisture? Um, I, I think it requires moisture, but I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm not sure about it because they've, they've been growing, you know, so hemp in, uh, in, uh, heading gear. So I'm, I'm not sure how tolerant it is, mm -hmm. but yeah, I guess it could be used. I don't see why not. I could see that there's the same kind of system where you have these wide rows between that you're walking on and whatever on, um, yeah. between the hops rows or between hemp or something like that. Yeah, good question. And this is just a brainstorm question. It, nothing, you know, immediate. I was just observing things. Yeah, I do. I mean, I do think on sandy soils, flax is another option that could be used. Um, so what, like lentils and things like that, if somebody wants to try some lentils, those like sandier soils, I think. Um, I've never had luck with them, but that's because I work mostly on these high clay soils. So I think that... Go ahead. Uh, I was just saying that uh, you mentioned field peas and buckwheat. Um, if you want to have more high carbon crop, then you may want to go with, say, oats or barley. Barley do not require a lot of water. That's why it's a bit salt tolerant. And so it would also be a suitable crop on um, sandy soils. And it's very high in carbon. So if you complement that with the peas, um, I think that, that would be... I personally think that if you want to build organic matter, you you have to have a balance between the carbon and nitrogen. Too much carbon would not be, you know, good because it's going to take a long time for the residue to break down. Too much nitrogen would also not be good. You know, it'll just break down very quickly, especially in that weather you have um, slightly drier and warmer weather. But if you have a, you know, a good mix. Um, you know, and it will take time for organic, organic material to turn into organic matter, but you will see some, some benefits of, you know, adopting those practices. And I think it should, you should be able to see that in two, three years, depending upon the year and the growth of the cover crop. But barley would be a, a, a crop I would recommend on sandy soils, along with the peas you're already having in that mix. Yeah, it sounds good. I was just trying to, you know, learn from what the farmer was also saying. It sounds like it's pretty much on track with some oats and barley as well. So thank you. I was just very curious. I have a question for Joe. Yeah, can you hear? Oh, it's Kim Retzloff uh, down here in North Central South Dakota. Um, couple of scenarios. Um, we seem to have a lot of people who want, uh, obviously trying to keep it cheap. So uh, going to uh, uh, soybeans next year, they're planting a, uh, a, a winter cereal like, 
rye or, or, or triticale, and we have tremendous water hemp pressures. Um, I, I'm not concerned in, in with so much once the stand gets established and it gets out here a month and a half from now, but for the next month and a half, what options do we have for controlling uh, residual-wise water hemp in, uh, in those crops? Yeah, that's a good question. So, yeah, in, in general, some of those cereals, even though it's not labeled, you you know you could get away with putting on any of those group 15 herbicides, such as Dual, Warrant, or Outlook. Uh, Zidua would be the most risky as far as injury to that type of crop. Um, yeah, and as far as burning down what's there, we, we can use, you know, the growth regulators such as 2,4-D or dicamba. Um, there is a plant back restriction for some of the small grains, but you know, in general, we haven't seen injury as far as establishment. So that's, that's kind of one of, again, one of those label things, if you're taking it to yield, um, then we have to follow that plant back restriction, but it, it would, I generally wouldn't expect injury for um, just getting them established in the cover crop type of situation. And like I said, if you wanted to, you know, burn them down with, you know, something like Gramoxone or one of those growth regulators, get at least one of the group 15s out there that will hold back the water hemp somewhat before you get the plants established. And with generics we have of all of those products, I just mentioned that they can keep it relatively cheap as well. So um, maybe I didn't realize warrant would work. Um, that's our plan on our legumes that will be going to corn next year is laying down warrant um, with the with the burn down um, so and back to the winter cereals um, we could stay fairly inexpensive with just a uh, um, now, the, now the warrant would that have to be on pre-emerge yes it will not control any emerged water hemp but uh, well, I meant pre-emerge on the on the rye or the oh. winter cereals it, it could be pre-emerge or post-emerge. Um, if, if you had it really close to planting, you might see some injury, but I would expect the rye to still come through that and become established. Okay, well, um, yeah, that way we can maybe do something inexpensive like a, a 2,4-D or small amount of Banville for uh, the existing, existing water hemp control and then um, uh, add the warrants, and it wouldn't be critical to get it on uh, prior to emergence if uh, weather would hold us out. Correct. Yes. Yes. All right. Okay. That's good. Um, the other question I have is um, um, we're starting to use more, uh, starting a program in the fall to put our uh, MTZ down, our 30 MTZ um, ahead of the soybeans in the late fall. Um, I call it Halloween application type of thing. It works really well in the spring. And then we're also throwing on a little bit of Roundup in, in 2,4-D for the uh, winter annuals like foxtail, barley, and mare's tail, and all, all, the, all the small seedlings, broadleaf seedlings to get started in, in the corn stalks uh, late in the fall. Um, do you see uh, any problem? Well, obviously, the you know, we wouldn't be able to do in the Roundup or the 2,4-D that late. So that would uh, be a problem as far as getting ourselves well. We wouldn't have a weed problem. We wouldn't have a fall annual weed problem if we had rye out there. But we would just need to put our empty seed down for the next spring. And make yeah, we would have to. There, there might still be some, might still be some weeds there. But you know, one of the benefits of having a cereal cover crop is if you have some broadleaf weed, you can use 2,4-D or dicamba late fall, and it'll kind of take out the weeds that are there, and then the cereal rye will suppress weeds into the spring as well. Right. Right, and, but I'd still want to put the MTZ down then because um, depending on what we do in the spring, if it's a dry winter in spring, we would want to terminate the, cere the, the winter cereal early and um, we wouldn't have the, uh, the competition in the spring. So we'd still like to, I think, put our, uh, our, uh, uh, like our 30 MTZ down in late fall there too with some 240 and just did the roundabout on that. Mercerial. And the, 
the biggest question in my mind would be how much of that authority MTZ will be tied up in the cover crop because some will be intercepted and be absorbed. Um, I wouldn't expect a lot of growth, so a lot will still hit the soil. Uh, it's just something I keep an eye on in the spring of when <coughs> weeds may start breaking a little bit earlier, but also with the cover there, it, I think it may end up being similar to what you would expect anyways. But Well, um, it, we probably would have a lot of growth because they're planting the uh, rye and triticale right now. Hmm. Now, that's another question. Is that to any, anyone? is uh, the reason we're getting in there is because these areas have dried up and we don't know how long they, they, they'll stay dry. Uh, so we're figuring, well, let's get in and we can uh, do what we need to do to uh, hold them down uh, if they get to be too much or, or just terminate them. Um, is it a mistake to be planting uh, the winter cereals uh, this early? I don't, I don't know. The, some of the winter cereals that I saw planted um, mid-year last year did, did fine. They just stay really low to the ground and they, they were fine. Um, you know, I, I don't know how well they did the next spring as far as, as growth. You know, they may have lost some of it over winter with planting them that early, but um, I don't know, Marisol, have you or Naeem seen any disadvantage? I haven't. I haven't seen that any problem. Do you hear much talk about triticale and any perceived advantage over rye? They talk about it doesn't get so tall in the spring as it matures. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if that matters, but I suppose it does for your residue if you're planting. Well, well, beans usually don't mind as much as corn does to that kind of competition. Yeah, I, just, I think is is more expensive than than winter rye or cereal rye. So, um, I guess I only see triticale being used where it's going to be grazed the next spring because it gives you a little bit more of a window um, before it, it really takes off with growth. I think than versus cereal rye. At least that's what I remember Kevin Sedovic talking about. Um, so I don't it's know. Very quality. It's very forage quality than rye than cereal rye. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's actually why the uh, seed salesman is selling it down here is because, um, and I just noticed in the earlier uh, uh, webinar here that um, you mentioned you don't think there's going to be a September 1. They're, they're counting on a September 1 instead of November, November 1 and then being able to, to take it off. But if they don't get that, then they're going to have definitely a lot more growth, I'm guessing, it, from what I read. It's about six and a half dollars a bushel, and they're planting about a bushel, I think. What is the seeding rate on rye for, for this type of scenario? I mean, I guess what, we, what we've been doing is 40, 40 pounds midsummer. I think you could go higher. Um, we're starting to learn that the, that the rates that we're using in the southern part of North Dakota are much lower than what we're using in the northern part of North Dakota. Um, right. So, for example, even just on interseeding, we can get away with 40 pounds of rye interseeded into our corn down, you know, on the North Dakota, South Dakota border. But um, up north, we're, we're going to be doing 60. Um, so yeah, South Dakota, I think you guys could be fairly low in your rates. It, you know, it just depends on how many plants you want established. Because um, I guess I do see a difference in Marisol. I don't know if this is real or not, I guess, but you know, when you have the lighter seeding rates, you get more of like it branches out and does this kind of thing versus if you have a higher seeding rate, you just get more little individual plants. That's right. Uh, you know, cereals do that, you know, it's called the tillering. <laughs> so if you have more space, you know, cover that space with tillers. Yeah, and some farmers says they like a higher rate because then they get a straight one stem plant, you know, uh, with no much tillering. So um, you, you have, it's easier to plant in it. They're getting these big, you know, wide kind of uh, plants on its own. But it's up to you what you want to do. But I've heard farmers say that they like the seeding rates, so the plants stay uh, individually. They're not huge plants. <laughs> the same for triticale, the same for all these areas. They all have the tillering ability. So low, low rates is going to produce a much wider and larger plant with many tillers. 
I have one other question, or, well, actually, I have one quick one for Joe, but first I want to uh, continue on the winter versus annual cereals. Um, it seems to uh, myself and, and us down here that we want something that we have the option of, uh, of, of working for us next spring if, it, if we continue to be wet. And that's why we're choosing the winter cereals. Um, the annuals, um, obviously, we're going to have to stop and, and, and stop at a certain time before they head and they get uh, too much uh, uh, carbon. Um, what is the, why, I hear you all talking a lot more about barley and oats rather than winter cereals. Why is that? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's well, the reason I would about barley and oats is when you're going to have corn next year, uh, rye can uh, become a problem, right? Because of right. Because there's several research that demonstrate they could reduce corn. So uh, you want an uh, annual crop that will winter kill. Okay, but in different situations, if you uh, you are interested in grazing late in the fall. Uh, you you know it depends when you plant. If, if you're going to have a lot of forage uh, there, you know if it's a PP situation, you're going to use it November first. If you plant too early, of course the annual cereals are going to be all headed with seeds in it. So right, yeah, and we're only planting our winter uh, uh, cereals on, on, on those, that which going to soybeans next year, and we're planting a. Uh, um, uh, I've understood. Well, we don't have a problem with winter cereals. I think Abby really likes rye and um, winter triticale where it works. It doesn't work here in eastern North Dakota. Winter triticale doesn't survive most years. That's why we don't use it. Um, oh. But we do use winter cereal rye, and Abby loves it before soybean. So, so how far south do you think you'd have to get? Well, we're not much more than south than the North Dakota line, so yeah. or maybe our, tri our triticale isn't going to survive either. Well, uh, which is, really Kale, um, is the eastern part of the states where we have uh, the clay soils and the combination of really low temperatures that I, you know, most years doesn't survive. But in western North Dakota, winter triticale is fine. So it's not only the south to north line. So if you are a little bit more to the center, uh, winter triticale, triticale might work. It's just, I think, in the Red River Valley, we have conditions that are they're very, uh, they're very harsh for winter crops. And we get a lot of even alfalfa winter killed because of the, the you know, there's many conditions they get together that, that uh, kill plants. And that includes uh, the heavy soils tend to accumulate a lot of water. And in the spring that forms ice, you know, when you get the melt of the snow forms ice in the surface and ice is what it really kills plants. This year I got pretty much every, Cover crop that I never survived before did this year because we had the snow fell before the cold temperatures, uh, which is not common. So this year I saw winter triticale didn't have a problem, even winter peas survived, hairy veg. Um, but uh, that's in the 10 years I've been working with cover crops, this is the first years I see that in the Red River Valley. But if you are outside the Red River Valley, your conditions are different. You are in more sandy soils. Uh, chances of ice cheating are are much less. So, and that's the main reason plants get wet to kill. All right, thank you. Well, one more quick question for Joe, and then I'll leave uh, yeah, I hope others. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, Joe, on uh, going to a uh, so we're going on to, to our corn or our grass crops next year. We're using trying to keep it cheap with uh, with uh, soybeans, possibly field peas, and maybe sunflowers. Um, what, what is, uh, and I, I haven't looked at the weed control guide, so just come to me, I thought about it now. Um, how will, uh, sunflowers and, uh, um, uh, peas handle warrant? I would expect you, you might get some injury, but I wouldn't expect them to be killed off. So it's yeah, another one of those things where it's, not labeled for those crops because the injury concern if if you were to spray it on the actual crop and but I, I wouldn't expect them to actually kill anything so uh, maybe maybe a little bit of stunting but they'd eventually grow out of it 
All right. Well, and that's maybe not all bad um, because, you know, instead of we'd like to go with just plain beans, but I don't think we can go with a single crop. So um, we were talking about, well, if we throw a little bit of field peas in there and, and, and uh, have some uh, Roundup beans that we were using, if we have to spray some weeds out later, we just uh, accidentally forget that we had field peas in there. But this, this would be a better way to, uh, to, to handle it uh, than in a, as far as a residual because, you know, we're just not going to have any competition, you know, probably all fall because they'll be planting them with 30 inch planters and, and uh, the weed con uh, concerns are for me are, you know, significant. Mm -hmm. So thanks. Yep. So I see another question came up in the chat box um, from Reed about what kind of legume or vetch would overwinter and grow in winter rye in the spring uh, to be in central South Dakota. Um, I'm, I'm just not a fan of hairy vetch. Uh, so I would stay away from, I would just stay away from vetches in general. I've used common vetch before um, and it's been okay as a full season, um, but hairy vetch, I, I stay clear of hairy vetch. Um, so maybe is there a legume that would overwinter? Is, we, we're using some red, red clover, right Marisol, to see if that has the highest chance. Yeah, it uh, depends the reason why you want it in there. Your red clover, uh, will survive, uh, so you just want it, uh, but it's not going to grow much. We haven't had much luck with clovers because they they are very small percent of the mix. But in South Dakota, you might be able to get a better stand. Rye is competitive, and so when you put a clover with a rye, the rye wins. <laughs> but red clover will survive the winter. You could also use, and I've seen some farmers using like a cheap alfalfa seed like, you know, an old vernal alfalfa, you know, that it costs a lot less than the varieties for alfalfa. And uh, yeah, you know, that's pretty much the only thing you'll survive. Hair vetch might survive, but like Abby said, if it sets seeds, you'll have hair vetch for life and you don't want that. So because they got dormancy and that's the reason we really don't like it because uh, we can, you can have that problem. And, um, uh, legumes, clovers with, you know, red clover, alfalfa, some people use a sweet clover. Um, those are would-be options. Did that answer your question, Reed? And I guess, you know, if, if you're looking for diversity, you know, if, if that's kind of what you're thinking, um, I mean, the work we're doing with winter camelina marisol would maybe be an option to get, you know, it's, it's a brassica, right? So it's, uh, but, it, but it does overwinter. Um, but you wouldn't want to see the winter camelina now. I mean, that would be, it's too early. You have to wait till October. Yeah, winter camelina is something we've been testing in our projects and it's a good alternative, especially if you're going to have corn next year, but you cannot plant it before September 1st because camelina loses the winter hardiness if you plant it in when it's hot in the summer. So you need to only plant it, uh, you know, either aerially seeded or plant, drill it after wheat, uh, but in September. You can plant it even until um, first week of October and it also ride the winter. Mm -hmm. But I you know, um, it won't fix nitrogen. <laughs> and uh, so it's not, you know, uh, not a legume, and, but it has other advantages. And, and our main reason that we're interested is if we could use it before uh, corn, uh, you know, to avoid the problems that we can have with rye. Thank you. Um... So my situation is uh, I get a farm in central South Dakota that has um, high, high uh, amounts of carbon to nitrogen. So I was looking at trying to um, put, I guess, more, more of a, a, a legume or something to break down some of that carbon. Um, it's just been corn on corn on milo on millet and uh, et cetera. Um, but it also has high amounts of weed pressure too. So that's why I was thinking rye with some sort of other, um, something to break down a little bit more of that carbon, uh, come springtime, uh, going back in with another, um, 
high high carbon product, I guess. Yeah. So are you are you in PP? That means you're gonna have a PP to plant something in the summer now, right? And maybe clovers, or you are planting this after your cash crop this year. Uh, it's uh, currently corn right now. Okay. Um, which it's still early enough you could intercede, which kind of thinking about right now. Yeah, see the the problem with corn, you will have to. Uh, yeah, the clovers the clovers don't do good. Uh, red clover does not good under shade. We've tried that and we lose most of it. It's not a very tolerant uh, to shade. So, um, but if you maybe uh, aerially uh, spread it onto. Uh, corn, you know, later season, you'll be able to uh, to get some plants and you might have some of the great clover in the following season. But it, it is, yeah, it is hard. We're trying intercropping of legumes into corn, but if, but in 30 inch corn, what we find now, because this is where we want it to happen, we want it to be able to put some nitrogen and so we see the fava beans and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, but most legumes are not tolerant to shade. And so rye that's actually pretty good and rye grass that's pretty good and the corn, but legumes don't, unfortunately. And that's why there's this whole movement of the 60 inch corn, because 60 inch corn does allow you to grow, uh, you know, other legumes to put some nitrogen back into your system. You know, if you're mainly high carbon crops, you know, corn or milo, um, or wheat and it, it's a good idea in the rotation to maybe have this new system. That's why I think a lot of people are trying it because they know we already find out with an all the force possible to do interseed in a V6 that uh, hasn't worked for the broad leaves very well. Yeah, and this and these are uh, an older planter so everything's on 38s. Um, 38. so it is, yeah okay. so it is a little wider. Yeah, so you might have, maybe maybe you can uh, spread the uh, clovers. You have more light coming into in, in the row, so you might have maybe uh, more possibilities to get those plants established at a wider row. Thanks. Yeah. Abby, is, is anything else you want to add to that? No, I, I think yeah, having that a like, little bit wider row would, would help us with establishing some of these. And I guess we don't know. I mean, <laughs> no, no. so we just tried with a 16 inch and we did a lot of interceding with 30 inch. And unfortunately, we have to say that broad leaves do not do good, especially legumes, into 30 inch corn. Now, 38 inches, it will be better. But how better it is, you know, the problem is the crops under the shade of corn. Um, you know, they're very uh, weak. And so you happen to get a couple of weeks of really hot weather and dry, they're actually gonna die because of uh, drought, right? So you got already plants that have been uh, weakened because of the shade. And so the combination of that, we've seen plants that look beautiful and they look really good under the canopy, but then you get a couple of weeks of dry period and then they'll dry, they'll die. But you can try, maybe you can try um, a few, you know, uh, passes or rows and put some clover, you have better chances to do that, um, to, to get that established uh, in your corn. And I'd say, let us, let us know how it goes. I mean, we've, we're yeah. doing some clovers. And things some like that. and, and that's the way we learn, just trying stuff. <laughs> you know, to be honest with you, corn and uh, corn and corn is, mm, you know, I don't want to say this, but I'm going to say this is not really good. You know, if you want to break down that cycle, you have to kind of like change your rotation a little bit, you know, to uh, let the whatever legume you want to plant to let it flourish a bit. And, you know, um, not just add the nitrogen, but produce some biomass. One drastic suggestion, which is slightly away from what we preach, is that you could also, if your cover crop or legumes are not doing good, you may want to apply some nitrogen through fertilizers. We are trying some demos here, litter bag demos here, where we add um, urea to say wheat straw, 
put it on the surface and bury the bags in the ground, as well as put some litter bags on top of the uh, soil without adding any urea. And we are finding out, like for a couple months in different crops, we are finding out that, you know, you lose, you know, residue is breaking down quicker. I, I, I don't like that way because it's not natural. But to be honest with you, if you if you have corn on corn and corn, you know, if you artificially add nitrogen to the soil, that may help you to break down that corn residue. And I quickly wanted to, um, I don't know whether um, Kim is this still on the call. He was asking about, um, I think he, he Oh, he's, he's still there. So he was asking about the I why that's we... that's different Kim, the one oh. Kim left. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I don't know whether that would be worth it. I'm just gonna say this uh, so that other people can listen. So he was saying that, why are we promoting barley and oats? I think they're fibrous uh, root plants. They grow well on a variety of soils. And another thing that I personally think uh, people are worried about wet is spring. I think that a wet fall contributes more towards a wet spring. So even if we have something which will not survive over winter, but if we have something good growing on the soil, and if we have a wet fall and those plants can use up some water, chances are that we won't have a lot of issues in this spring. Hi, this is Kim, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I just switched to my phone to go mobile. Um, so you're the I, same, Kim? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, Were you able to? Yeah, go ahead. And, uh, of course, a lot of the uh, edges of, uh, of our PPs are along uh, cattail draws, et cetera, that will uh, um, have those types of, and I thought about that right away, and you mentioned uh, barley, of course, and that's another reason we were talking about sunflowers is, is to try and find something that's readily available and expensively down here in South Dakota but can also handle uh, those areas that are um, most more often in the PP uh, areas. So that's a good point. Uh, barley would be more salt tolerant, Kim, than even sunflowers. Even oats right. would be more salt tolerant. Right. So this is another reason, you know, we, we, we like these crops. But I would again say that we would like to see a legume in that. To Reed's point, you know, we want that residue to break down. Uh, because it will then ultimately go into the organic matter pool. Plus, it will not cause any issues for you when you're trying to plant your crops in the spring. I, I give more importance. The wettest springs I've seen here in Langdon, and if you check the weather, uh, we are a bit colder than all of the areas around us. And we have had some very wet falls. I think Fall contributes more um, if, if we have some challenges next to spring. If you could manage your water, excess water during the fall, most often you will not have any major issues during the spring, next to spring. Okay, what other questions? We have about 15 minutes left. Um, does anybody have a field they wanna put out there? It's just a scenario for what could be done if you just tell us the you know, what crop was on there last year, what you want to go to next year, and um, maybe what the soil type is, and probably where you are is helpful too, as you, whether you just say northeast corner of North Dakota or southeast corner. Or... Hi, Abby, can you hear me? <laughs> yep. Yeah, I'm actually a little farther. I'm in southwestern Ontario. Um, <clears throat> so not quite in your corner. But I do have a question on um, some cover crops after wheat, winter wheat. Uh, we'll be harvesting here in about a month or three weeks. And uh, so I, it is underseeded with double cut red clover. Um, but there is, we had a lot of rain last fall. I've got some pretty bad water erosion through some of the spots that I like to fix. But then I'd also like to reseed it with uh, a cover crop to hold it together for the fall and just wondering if there's anything that i guess um would complement i guess the, either the red clover or uh or something that i should stay away from it's going into corn next year 
So I, I typically use the, the nitrogen credit from the clover to help with the corn. And uh, I don't know if trying to seed down red clover again in the spots that I fix is going to work. Like we normally frost seed it in the spring. So I've never, I guess I've never seeded red clover this late in the year in the summer. I didn't know if. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, so is, is Dan Petker kind of by you? Um, you see him on Twitter and stuff. Because I think he was telling me that he does a, a clover buckwheat mix. Um, and so I don't know if you go in those patches with buckwheat just because it grows so quickly, if that would be, would be beneficial. Um, I'm going to have Marisol weigh in on this too because I know a lot of things work for you guys that don't work up here. Okay, sorry, I missed your, your question. What was it? Paul, were you asking? Um, is there anything that complements uh, um, a double cut red clover under seeding in uh, winter wheat um, in areas that I'm going to rip out to fix some water erosion that I had last fall? Yeah, okay. Um, Overseeding clover is a practice that actually um, over wheat that has been done. It's, it's a really old practice. It came out of uh, the Sweden and Norway. They do that a lot in wheat to protect their soils from erosion. So it, I know some people have done in Minnesota too. I don't have experience and I haven't tried. I know. A, some um, of our researchers in the Carrington station try uh, an experiment to try to oversee clover onto wheat. So you have a green cover when you harvest the wheat. And your area, I think it should work. I don't see why not. It, it just depends on moisture. You know, if you don't have enough moisture to get the clover going, uh, you might lose it. That's all, because it's small seed. But um, I saw, I, I've been in Sweden and, and I've seen that practice and for them works really well, but they get a lot of rain too. They never have like this dry spell. So, so it, it, it is a way to get the clovers going. So they do use red clover mainly to do that. So it sounds like Paul, you already have the clover established under there. He's just going to go in and repair some, some damaged parts of the field. So probably wants to reseed in some of those areas he repairs. Um, so yes, could we seed red clover that late or, or, you know, it'll be in what, three or four weeks that you'll do that? Yeah. Yeah, you can, you can receive the clover. It's, there's no problem with allelopathy or anything. You can receive it. You want to, um, if you, you want it to survive the winter, we usually recommend that you at least have six to eight weeks of growth on your clover. So make sure it survives. So you won't want to plant it too late. Usually even for a FAFA, we say that, that about first week of August will be our cutoff date to plant alfalfa to make sure it survives the winter. Does that answer yeah, your question? Yeah, yep. Typically, yeah, we terminate the uh, clover um, in early to late fall, um, just so that we, we're a little heavier tillage than in okay. our area, so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no. Now, buckwheat won't overwinter, will it? It's not. Buckwheat not is going to freeze, right? It freezes, with, you know, even 32 is going to be gone. It's very susceptible. So. Okay. But you grow buckwheat for seed, or you're using it just to cover crop? No. Well, just that um, what Addie was talking about, a clover buckwheat mix. Yeah. In those areas, yeah. just because buck, she was saying, yeah, because of buckwheat being faster growing. Yeah, buckwheat's going to grow really fast, flower, and die very soon. <laughs> so, but, and then the clover will be longer. But. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is the part I really like is trying to figure out what we can do on specific fields and pulling everybody's thoughts together. Mm -hmm. Um, this is Kim again. Can you hear me? Yep. Well, I, I just switched to go mobile and uh, I had to figure out how to use my personal hotspot and all, so I did miss some. Um, <clears throat> um, I think his name was mentioning to me about putting uh, uh, 
barley in, in, in the fall, in the mix for the salt tolerance in those low areas, and that's a good idea. Um, I guess I wasn't aware that it was just the winter rye that was giving us uh, problems going to corn, theoretically. Um, I assumed it was cereals. At one Minnesota meeting some time ago, we, we heard that uh, you, you plant a, a broadleaf cover crop to a cereal and vice versa. But if that's not the case, um, for moisture consumption mainly, um, uh, there's nothing wrong with growing with a, growing with a, like a triticale or like you say a barley or some annual um, and going into a corn also next year to make our program simpler rather than trying to find, uh, you know, do two different things depending on if it's going to be corn or beans next year. I guess I, I'm concerned about planting corn into anything that overwinters, um, mainly because the competition and the nitrogen tie up. Um, one way to possibly get around that, and I know quite a few farmers that um, are in areas that were pretty hard hit with PP this year, um, they're going to try just strips of cover crops versus seeding the whole field. So like say you go in with 30 inch row spacing on something like a winter annual and then you plant your corn between those rows, at least that gets it away um, away from where you're planting the corn. And I think farmers are gonna do that for, for edible beans, for soybean, for pretty much anything this next year in areas that were pretty hard hit because they're concerned about having uh, that cover crop and the extra residue from the cover crop in the row that they're gonna plant it. So you can almost do a reverse of the bio strips that we talk about where you just plant it between the rows instead of on the row that you're gonna plant on. And maybe, maybe you could get away with it in a wet year and that kind of stuff. But, um, but that's one thing, if, if you're pretty, set on, on doing you know something like a cereal rye, winter triticale, winter wheat, whatever before corn, um, I would just try to get it away from the corn rows you're gonna plant into and still terminate um, prior to planting if you can. Okay, that brought up, I know we're getting a uh, first in time here. That brought up one more quick question, fertility wise, I don't know if we have anybody on. Um, how do we um, soil test, uh, uh, especially these cereals that will be, um, 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 harboring a lot of the nitrogen when we're out there typically uh, you know October early November and uh, doing our zone testing and stuff um, how, how in the world are we going to be able to estimate how much nitrogen you know to, to, to actually go ahead and, and fertilize that fall or this fall or next spring Um, Abby, you want me to answer that? Well, you know, uh, we, uh, Dr. Franson, uh, yeah, he's not on the call, but he's been doing a lot of work on trying to determine the nutrient cycling of cover crops to the following crop. And in summary, in all these years that uh, he's been doing experiments uh, with Abby in large scale, um, whatever nitrogen the cover crops take in the fall is not available for the corn next year. You know that we don't. I have thought that was the. I, I thought, sorry, I thought that was the concept of uh, one of the is to is to grab it from uh, getting away in the groundwater and storing it in the residue, and then it releases. Uh, it won't release for like an early cereal like wheat, but I always understood it. Uh, even like a regrowth of uh, uh, volunteer wheat in the fall will hold any nitrogen. And it, re it will release it for the corn crop that needs nitrogen in late June, mainly now, into you know uh, 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 pollination time period. So, I completely agree with you, and we all thought the same. <laughs> and the books will tell you that the CN, you know, low CN wow. ratio of other crops will release it. But all the research we've done these last four years, Dr. Francis has been doing, and this is not only us, also in Wisconsin, Mac work has observed and uh, the research data is pretty solid that you do not get the credit that we thought we would give. Wow, so when will that be? protected when? from the water, it will be in the soil at some point, but it's not being released for the next crop. Okay, so the, have those studies followed the, uh, the, them and to find out when they are being released? Well, <laughs> that's what Dr. Francis is trying to figure out. Where is the nitrate going, right? Interesting. Um, yeah. we, we don't know much. He has a theory that 
that uh, some of that nitrogen might be getting, uh, you know, absorbed on the clays uh, because we have this uh, smectite clays that kind of, uh, you know, expand when there's our water and then shrink and trap ions like ammonia and potassium and other things. So he's thinking, so he's doing some analysis of non-extractable ammonia and the preliminary that data that he got is showing that where there was a cover crop, the levels of non-extractable uh, non ammonia, that means not available for the plants, was higher. But so that's where the research is leading to try to find out the what, where is the nitrogen going that is not showing on the corn. And he always said that, uh, Abby, you can correct me, uh, he, in the cafe talks we have, he recommends, he says, if you are not sure and you're hoping then in some cases it might release it, what you can do is just keep a strip, you know, without, with, you know, with less nitrogen, considering some credit from the cover crop. And then, um, then you can, if you see that compared to the rest of your corn that you defertilize normally, uh, this one looks a lot yellow and deficient, then you can go and fix that uh, with a, a split application and add the nitrogen. So uh -oh. it's a, you can you can try, you know, to see what's happening. Did I say it right, Abby? I don't know. Pretty, pretty close, Maris. You're really sounding like a soil scientist, which I love. Um, <laughs> I'm just repeating what you guys told me. Oh, that's great. So, so Franza would say do the opposite, where you'd have the whole field where you apply, you know, reduced amount of nitrogen, but then you have a strip where you apply the full amount. And okay. then if you, if you see differences, then you side dress um, the other corn. So... So yeah, I think. And well, I, I'm going to I'm gonna get hung by a noose if I come here and tell these guys that they need to go side uh, dress their corn next uh, June when we can hardly <laughs> get our spraying done. But anyway, um, I understand. And I, but um, so my question then is, what value is our nitrogen cell test this fall on 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 uh, uh, cereal cover crops that are planted at this time of the year? I mean, where do we know where we are on that curve or that scale of it being, I mean, if it's virtually zero, which it should be by that time, because it's gonna have a tremendous amount of growth, um, we're basically, whereas if we don't plant a cover crop, um, I, I know the whole, uh, 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 um, you know, microbial, mycorrhizae thing, but, you know, back in the summer fallow days, it actually accumulated nitrogen are we actually, is it, is it costing us money by the cereals consuming the nitrogen but not giving it back to us? Because if it gives it back to us after the corn crop next year, it's of no value because then it's going to be available for the beans the following year and they're just going to luxury consume. I think, I think it would be some assumptions you could make is that if we have a long fall and you get a lot of growth on the cereals, um, that they will take up more nitrogen, so there will be less available. Um, that would be one thing. If it's a shorter fall and less growth, then maybe you could assume that there might be a little bit more available, but th that would be the, the general, that would be the most I'd step I'll out. Probably, yeah, I'll probably have to talk to friends, and then maybe we have to look at it like uh, uh, one of you said earlier, that you, you're actually going to maybe get more benefit out of the fall moisture drying uh, growth than you would out anything in the spring anyway, because in the spring, um, you know, it moves quickly to uh, reproduction, which well, I, suppose, I guess reproduction uses more moisture than vegetative basically. But um, well, I if, if we just ter terminate these in the fall crop, even if it's a cereal terminated, if we terminate it at some point, will it be available for the corn next year? Yeah, I, I think what I would do is I would just I would just say that the benefits are going to be in that it dries the soil out. So if you have less denitrification, um, then maybe that's that's where you look for the benefit. I don't know that terminating it because you know I mean from what I hear yeah. from say a lot of the okay we you know they'll say well we planted a cover crop and then two years later we feel like we saw the benefits and that's just an observation. But um, but you know as far as what Franzen and I are seeing on those plots working with Marisol, we're 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 not, I don't think we've seen it released yet in those. And we have a long-term no-till system that's 40 plus years no-till with 20 years of cover crops. And we have a recently converted site to, that, that would just be four years no-till. And we're just not, in our soils here, we're not seeing it become available. Which, you so know. So maybe I need, 
maybe I need to stay with the plan of a, a cereal to a uh, soybean next year because the nitrogen isn't going to matter and a legume or a non-cereal uh, this year to a corn next year because the non-cereals, the broad leaves won't have uh, as much maybe nitrogen can, uh, uh, holding or, or, or yeah, consumption. And I, and I think that's the system that works. I mean, going from the winter winter cereal to a broad leaf is really, you know, where we don't see the effects on crop yield and we're not expecting any nitrogen to be released. And then, yeah, some kind of broad leaf prior to your corn crop. Um, right. You know, and I think okay. that system is what I think we sh I think we found that that works. That just works. You know, it's um, works well. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, and I see Greg puts on here uh, cover crops aren't for a one year gain; it's long term. And and I yeah, I think that's where you're going to really see the benefits is the building organic matter uh, that still takes years to do, but um, but yeah, it's it's a long term long term thing. But you prove also soil aggregation, and you mentioned the microbial biomass goes up. So it, there's a lot of benefits. It's just the nitrogen is not cycling like we thought previously. And this is not only for uh, cereals taking the nitrogen. Uh, uh, Dr. Franson has worked with radish, uh, with legumes, and none of them are releasing, are releasing the nitrogen to the next crop. I think the couple short-term benefits of growing cover crops would be one, improving infiltration, which partly also includes uh, less tillage, and then increased water holding capacity. So one would, infiltration will work actually under drier weather as well as wet weather, because under wet weather, you want that water to go into the soil. And under drier weather, you still want that water to go into the soil to become available for plants. These two things, increasing uh, infiltration in water holding capacity, to me, I've actually seen fields which have improved these two properties in two to three years. And I'm not gonna say every soil is gonna act like that, but I have seen that in, in person. Um, and that these two are pretty important soil properties. Mm -hmm.